Hey there, I'm Dr. Shauna Dingman, and I had the amazing opportunity of being able to be in your child's class to talk about the wonders of the human body for their health or science unit. Um, I practice in Port Perry. My practice is called Elevate Women's Health Center, and I, I am actually a pediatric and pregnancy chiropractor. So I've got postdoctorate certifications in the care of kids, and that's why I'm super passionate about educating them and helping them understand how we can create health habits that will carry them through the rest of their lives. So I wanted to record this webinar for you guys as parents so that you know exactly what we talked about. I'll share all the slides that I shared with them and tell you what it was that I said to them so that when you guys are sitting around the dinner table, if they even say that they had a speaker in, you know what we talked about, you can answer questions. And if you can't answer them, you know where to go for the answers but mostly to just provide you with some discussion points, things that you guys can talk about. I've got three kids of my own and two of them are teenagers, so I know sometimes how difficult it is to create conversations. So this can be a great conversation piece. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you and you can see exactly what it was that your child experienced. Okay, so as I said, I'm Shauna Dingman. I am a chiropractor at Elevate Women's Health Center. And the topic of today's, um, or the, the presentation that I did for your kids was the amazing Dr. You. And I asked them, has anyone ever told you how amazing your body is? Have you ever really thought about it? We talked about how many cells there are in the human body. And I got them to guess how many there might be. And the first guess was actually, it was a great opening guess. It was, you know, one of the girls said, well, I think it's somewhere around the population of the world. So around seven to 10 billion. Again, great guess. I told them, nope, it's bigger, it's bigger. Last guess I took was 50 billion. So they were definitely, you know, thinking big. But for kids, the idea of billions is huge, but there are actually 50 to 75 trillion cells in the body. And to try and give them an idea of just how vast that number is, I actually had one of the kids volunteer to come up and write the number 75 trillion on the board. And I said, you get a prize if you get the right number of zeros. So it was awesome. This kid actually nailed it first time and got a pack of Mentos. <laughs> okay, so then we talked about how the body is constantly regenerating. I explained to them that cells are sort of the basic unit of the body. Our bodies are made up of cells and everything in our body is being regenerated all the time. So your liver, for example, takes about 28 days to regenerate. So every month you have a brand new liver. That's pretty cool. Your skin cells are replaced every two weeks or so. And I told them, you know, did you know that the dust that's in your house is actually a whole bunch of dead skin cells of the people living in your house? And they were totally grossed out by that. That was awesome. Uh, you know, if you've ever burnt the roof of your mouth on something really hot, those cells in there, they're very, very quick turnover cells, which is why after a couple of days, you don't even feel it. And then there are some cells in the body that really take a long time to regenerate like the skeleton, so bone cells. So if, you have, if you've ever broken a bone or your kids have broken bones, you know there's, I mean, part of the reason you need to be in a cast for months is because those cells take months to regenerate. But the reality is that, uh, you know, every, every few years, every say two to five years, you are an entirely different person. And the cells that you create really depend on the habits that you have today. So if you want to be a super healthy person two years from now when all those cells get replaced, then do really great things for your body. Treat it really well. Um, and if you don't treat it well, then you're, you're not going to have the same kind of health that you may want to have. Oh, you know, we talk about bad bad dad jokes and bad mom jokes all the time in our house. It's kind of a thing that we do. It makes my kids moan and groan all the time. So I told them this in the class that, you know, I like to share some of my bad mom jokes with them. So I asked them, why did the skeleton not go out for Halloween? And they sat there and thought about it. And then I said, because he had no body to take him out. And the kids just, they just, the drama. Oh, that's so terrible. It was awesome. Okay. So people are truly awesome and our bodies are truly awesome. If you get a chance to check out this YouTube video with your kids, I showed it to them in class. 
they loved it. It's really about people doing incredible things, incredible feats that require a lot of training and adaptation. But you know, when you, when you go to those lengths with your body, your body can do absolutely astounding things that you would never think of. So we looked at this plant and I said, okay, something is wrong with this plant. And I said, you know, obviously looking at the left side of the plant and right away they said the plant's dying. And I said, right. So a plant has certain requirements for health. What would a plant require if you wanted to get this plant healthy again? And again, the answers were amazing. They just hit it right on, right from the get-go. Well, the plant needs sunlight and the plant needs water and the plant needs good soil. Somebody said fertilizer, someone even said nutrients, which was great. That was exactly what I wanted them to see. And I said, you know, we all know what it takes for a plant to be healthy. It's really very simple. And I said, you know, human beings have the exact same thing. We have certain requirements that we need for health. And that's what we're gonna talk about from this point on. I really wanted them to get this idea that if they can fill their bodies genetic requirements for health using certain strategies, then their possibility for having amazing health as they grow through life is so much better. Okay, so the first requirement that we talked about was you have to have a really good brain-body connection. I asked them, what is the most important organ in the body? And to be honest, it's kind of cheating that I had a picture of the brain because right away they kind of went, the brain. And it's funny because when I do workshops for adults, often um, adults will say, you know, without a picture of the brain, often adults will say the heart. And although the heart is a really important organ, my question is always, well, what tells the heart to beat? The brain. So the brain and nerve system are really, that is everything in your body. And we have to have this incredible connection between our brain and our body in order for us to function properly. I explained to them that um, the, the nerve system is the brain, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and the spinal nerves. So everything you see in this picture, that's what creates the nerve system and that the brain is in contact with every single one of those 75 trillion cells all the time, every second of every day of every year of their lives. And that's how the body stays connected to the brain. And I showed them this picture of the safety pin. Um, you know, we really kind of, we think of health in terms of, we, we call it a safety pin cycle. So if you look at the brain is at the top of the safety pin and the body is at the bottom of the safety pin. And if the brain wants to tell the body to do something, it sends messages down the spinal cord. So down the nerve system and out to the cells. And then the cells will respond. So the body will respond, hopefully appropriately, and give um, give feedback back up to the brain so that the brain can either tweak or, you know, the brain can say, yeah, we're good. So here's what I had them do. I said, okay, put your pointer finger in the air. And what I want you to do is touch your finger to your nose and keep your finger there. So they did that. And I told them, you know, when your finger is out here, your brain is telling your finger that it wants you to touch your nose. And then when your finger gets here, your nose and your finger are giving your brain feedback that, yep, we have contact. And then I said, okay, you can put your fingers down. What if, you know, if my finger was out here and it was supposed to touch my nose, but it hit my cheek instead, what would happen is my cheek and my finger would tell the brain, no, we missed. So we need to kind of recalibrate and try it again. And that's how we would get to the nose. So it's this constant safety pin cycle of messages coming down um, the spinal cord and out the spinal nerves to the cells and then cells sending messages back up to the brain in order to tell the brain how things are going. And so much of this happens without, I mean, most of this happens without us ever thinking about it. So for example, you know, if I held a smelly sock under your nose, you'd probably go, oh, right away. You know, your brain would tell your body without you having to think about it, do that. Or, you know, if you've ever touched a hot stove, I know I've done it. That's actually such a quick reflex. It doesn't even hit the brain. That's actually a spinal reflex that happens so quickly that your spine has a special reflex pathway that it can withdraw your hand without having to take the extra time to actually go to the brain. So it is absolutely incredible how this all works. 
I told them that one of the ways we know that the, the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord are so important, the most important is because it's the only system in the body that actually has a bony armor. Okay, it has its own protective coating because what's inside the spine is the spinal cord. So I asked them, you know, how many bones are there in the spine? And their guesses were, actually their guesses were kind of all over the place, but they really, their guesses were in the range of the number and it's 33. And those 33 movable bones, they allow our bodies to move around. It's really cool. So yes, we can protect the spinal cord, but we also have this incredible ability to be flexible and have range of motion, which is really cool. And I told them that one of the things I do um, with almost every patient that comes in, I mean, unless they're too young that they can't stand up or if someone's pregnant or nursing, I often will take an x-ray of their spine because I want to see what exactly is going on inside. It'll help me to see where the problems are, but also how long the problem has been there. And so I told them, you know, when I look at an x-ray of you from front to back, I want to see that your spine is poker straight like a meter stick but it's not the same when I look at the spine from the side. So if you look at that side view, you'll see that there's a big S shape um, shape to it. And it's really three curves, in one in the neck, one in the top part of the back, and one in the low part of the back. I expect to see those three curves when I look from the side. And it's like, you know, if somebody builds a bridge, they build the bridge in the shape of an arc. That arc shape helps to give the spine strength, and flexibility. So those curves and the shape of the spine, they're very, very important. And when the spine looks like that picture where it's straight up and down from front to back, but it has those three beautiful curves from the side, then we know that the spinal cord inside is in its most relaxed position. It's in the position that allows it to carry those messages from the brain to the rest of the body as well as possible. So now the problem is, well, what happens if the spine gets shifted out of, out of position? So what could possibly do that? And right away they said car accidents, they said big falls, and yes, for sure. So major traumas, you know, you can see here, we talked about sports. So, uh, you know, as I'm recording this, the Leafs are in the finals right now. Um, everybody's watching hockey. So we talked about, you know, just some of those checks into the boards or the hits that athletes take, whether it's on the field or on the ice or whatever, that can cause a lot of damage to the spine. And typically everyone will have some kind of major trauma. And I'm thinking probably mostly car accidents. Most people have been in a car accident by the time they're an adult. Not everybody though. So it's possible that an adult could get through their life without any major trauma, but everybody has these little, we call them micro traumas. The things that we do day in and day out that are actually not good for our spines, but can really affect the shape of our spine. So I said, you know, some of you have parents who commute long distances for their jobs, or they sit all day in an office. Our bodies were not really designed for sitting. Um, and I showed them, you know, these pictures of the, the kids at the bottom looking at their devices. And I said, does anybody look like these guys? And they were all like, oh, that's totally me. So we talked about device use and just, I mean, this is a brand new thing that is, it's devastating to kids' spines. I mean, when I look at x-rays of kids that I took back in, my, in the early years of my career, you know, closer to 2000 um, versus now, it's incredible the damage that kids have on their spine now that they didn't have 15 years ago. And really I attribute it to the device use that we have because it's not just that they're in this sustained position. There's actually a, a clinical term for it now called text neck. Um, so they're in this sustained position that's really not good for their spine. But on top of that, because they're doing these activities, they're now no longer outside playing manhunt and after the flag and swimming and running and biking, um, you know, you don't see kids out on the street playing like you used to anymore because they're inside gaming and on their devices. So something that I, I really wanted to hit home to them that this is something that requires control. It requires a certain amount of time and then make sure you put the devices down and you get outside and play because play is really important. So I talked about how messages are passed down, you know, from the brain to the body 
through the spinal cord. And it's like this information superhighway. And I said, think about a garden hose. So if you were going to water your grass and the water's coming out beautifully, the grass is gonna be green. I said, well, what would happen to the grass if I stepped on the hose? And right away someone said, well, the grass wouldn't get the water that it needs, so it would get brown and start to wither. Exactly. The same thing happens if your spine shifts and it puts pressure on the spinal cord. It's kind of the flow of messages. It's kind of like someone stepping on a garden hose. So I explained to them, you know, whatever's at the other end of that message, right? So say the brain is trying to tell the stomach how much acid to create to digest your food, but it can't get the message because there's some kind of a shift in the structure of the spine. How well is the stomach going to be able to respond? And they said, not good. And I said, okay, so over time, are you going to be able to digest better or digest worse? And they said worse. Exactly. And that's, I mean, honestly, that is sort of the long and short of what I do as a chiropractor in the realm of the nerve system. My job is to make sure that the messages are passed from the brain to the body as well as they possibly can in that. If there's some kind of a shift in the structure, my job is to simply take the pressure off the cord so the brain and the body can communicate as clearly as possible. And however that plays out in their health, that's what the body's going to do with it. Now, I had to start skipping through slides because honestly, they had awesome questions when we did some demonstrations. They were right up there. So um, to be honest, <clears throat> from a time perspective, what I'm going through with you is much quicker than what I was able to go through with them because they, we talked a lot and we had some lots of really cool things going on in the class. So one of the things that I, you know, I would say to you that I didn't say to them is the spine is kind of like a circuit breaker, and I don't mean to simplify it, but if you think about, for example, when somebody has a heart attack, one of the cardinal signs of a heart attack is that left arm pain. Why on earth, if the cells of the heart are dying, why would you get left arm pain? And the answer, again, just you know, to simplify, is that they're on the same circuit. So you know, if I have, we used to own a house where if I was in the master bathroom, and I was microwaving something in the kitchen. For some reason, the plugs in the bathroom were on the same circuit as the microwave in the kitchen, just the microwave. I have no idea why. So if I use the hairdryer in the bathroom and I was warming up my coffee, for example, I blow the fuse and everything, everything would just not work. And it's kind of like that with the spine. You know, if, if there's too much pressure on the spinal cord in a certain area, you may not feel it in some ways and you may feel it in other ways. The, the body has this incredible capacity to produce symptoms or telltale signs that something is wrong. And it's there to, to tell you, I need you to pay attention to something. Something is wrong and I need you to fix it. So for example, um, you know, if people have changes in the structure of their neck, for example, one of the really common symptoms is headaches. You may get a headache without any neck pain, right? So if you get neck pain, it's kind of easy to say, well, there's a problem here, but if you have a headache, it may not be so clear. So if you think about the spine kind of like a circuit breaker, that's, I mean, that's a good indication or a good example of kind of how it works. And like I said, this is where I come in. So, and I didn't go into this with the kids, but I think it's important that you know that um, you know, traditional chiropractors, what they will do is really focus on the symptom itself. So if you have low back pain, they typically will do things that will help where your low back pain is. I am what's called a life by design chiropractor or a structural chiropractor. So I'm looking at the whole structure of the entire spine. So I may take an x-ray of your whole spine, even though you may be complaining that the pain is only in your low back. And we may find that the problem is actually coming from way up higher and when we fix that, it can change the whole face of a problem that you may have been dealing with for many, many years. And what we're doing is we're looking at, you know, how did the spine create these things in ways that you felt, but may also be creating problems in your health that you don't feel yet. And we want to make sure that we can fix them before you do feel all those things. So back to our flower, we talked about the first requirement being a good brain body connection. The next requirement that we talked about was nutrition. And this is probably, I mean, outside of the spine itself, 
this is probably the single biggest topic of conversation that I have in my office. People really want to know, how do I feed myself better? How do I feed my family better? And kids can be ridiculously hard to feed well. I know. I mean, even in our family where we talk about good nutrition principles all the time and my husband, who's also a chiropractor, we really model these things well. It's a challenge. I get it. So I wanted them to begin to take ownership of why parents make certain nutrition decisions so that, you know, you just get less pushback and hopefully a little bit more of their ownership into how to eat better. So what I said to them is, if, if there's only one thing that you remember about the food part of this presentation, it's this. Eat real food as much as you possibly can. And then we talked about, well, what, what does real food look like? Real food doesn't typically come in a box. Um, you know, it typically has a certain texture and it's got, you know, if you're talking about fruits and vegetables, lots of color. And we talked about what are examples of real food. So we played this, this game called real or not real and we went through this list of foods and they got every single one of them everybody knew it was thumbs up if it's real food thumbs down if it's not real food and if they weren't sure it was thumb to the side um and i think the only thing they weren't sure about was the granola bar and i said you know what that makes sense because a granola bar is not actually real food but it can have real food in it if you have a granola bar that has nuts and raisins and things like that that's real food so some of these things were obvious. Halloween candy, definitely not real food. Um, you know, things like potatoes, I think in their head they were thinking about potato chips and fries and things like that. So they were kind of like, I'm like, yeah, potatoes, real food for sure. So they did awesome being able to identify which foods were real and which foods were not. And I said, you can have some of the not real foods sometimes, but it can't be part of every meal all the time. You have to choose very, very carefully. Um, I typically tell adults, you know, when you're doing your grocery shopping, you're going to find real food all around the perimeter of the grocery store. So stay in the perimeter as much as you can and try not to hit the inside of the aisles. I mean, unless you need paper towels and napkins and things like that. So what happens to food after we eat it? It was funny. I said, you know, what do you think happens to food once you eat it? And the kids were a little bit gob -gob. They They kind of went like, I don't know. You know, it's, it's not something, even though... I think they know intuitively that food helps them grow, for example. They didn't really know what exactly happens. So I said, you know, think about Lego. You know, they all pl have played with Lego at some point in time. If you had this great big Lego city and you took it all apart into every one of its single Lego pieces and then you rebuilt something else with it, that's exactly what your body does with food. Your brain sends the stomach and your digestive system messages to take it all apart and then it's going to use it to rebuild those new liver cells and the skin cells that we talked about before that's why i talked about them because it's all part of this process so the food that you eat today becomes the muscle cells the eye cells the heart cells the lung cells the bone cells the brain cells of tomorrow and so my question to them is you know, how do you want your new cells to be tomorrow? Do you want them to be um, burger and fries cells or do you want them to be chicken and broccoli and strawberry cells? And it was amazing. I, you know, I thought for sure most of them would go, no, nah, burgers and fries. Nope. They all said, oh, I want chicken breast cells. So it was pretty cool. <clears throat> I wanted them to know these words. These are the three different kinds of foods, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. The reason I wanted them to know this is because when we're choosing foods, I told them, I want you to try and have fats and proteins and carbohydrates as much as you can in every single meal that you eat, whether it's a meal or it's a snack. And then we looked at all these pictures and I, you know, we talked about, okay, what, what is a protein? So it's your meats and fish and dairy, eggs, nuts, Nuts are actually proteins and they're fats. Um, and I said, you know, if you're vegetarian, you probably are really well acquainted with beans and chickpeas and lentils and things like that that are called legumes. So those are your sources of protein. Fruits and veggies, everybody knows. And then fats, that was, I mean, this is really kind of a different concept for kids because I think when, when kids still think of fats, they think about bad things. They think about things like French fries and chocolate and potato chips and stuff like that. And all those things do have bad fats in them. But I tried to just tell them that there are lots of really good healthy fats and your body needs those healthy fats because that makes up a big, big part of your nerve system. 
brain cells, all the spinal tracts and the nerves that, that um, create the nerve system, they are high, high, high in fat because it's good insulation. It, it, I didn't tell this that, that, but I'm telling you, it helps the messages, the electrical signals that pass from nerve to nerve. It helps insulate them as they go down so that they don't get lost. So you need good fats in order to have healthy growth and development. So getting back to that point with them about, you know, you're going to be a whole new person two years from now. So what do you want your two years from now body to be made of? Do you want it to be made of donuts and cake? Or do you want it to be made of vegetables and healthy meats? And they were awesome. They all said that they really wanted it to be made of vegetables and healthy meats. And I really tried to help them understand these are the decisions that your parents are making all the time when they're feeding you, when they're grocery shopping, when they're packing your lunch. Sometimes it seems like, oh, why do we have to eat this stuff? But it's because your parents want you to have that really healthy two years from now body that's made of vegetables and healthy meats. Um, now, again, we started to skip through things really quickly here, but one of the things that I find is we tend to live in a very grain-based, fast food-based, um, very carb, carb-heavy society. And when I'm talking about carbs, I'm not talking about vegetables. Um, we need to make sure that our kids are eating protein at every single meal. It's satiating. It's good for their body. It helps them develop. It's great for them, for their brains and it helps to balance out some of the other things that they're eating. So when we talk about protein, we're talking about having a serving that's about the size of the palm of your hand, right? So obviously if you're a bigger person, you're going to have a bigger serving of meat. If you're a smaller person, it's going to be a smaller serving and about the um like about the width of a hockey puck that is a good protein serving size for a meal we talked about sugar really briefly and i wanted them to know sugar when we have too much of it is so devastating to our health it is it's a poison and you know if you know anyone who's diabetic or maybe you're diabetic yourself you know that someone who's diabetic has to watch their blood sugar so so carefully because if their blood sugars are not regulated very very carefully they could die and the problem is we have such sugar laden nutrition in our culture right now and especially our kids it's uh, it's a little frightening i mean as a healthcare practitioner this is probably one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in health right now is simply the amount of sugar that we are consuming. And it's not just, it's not the white sugar. It's not just the candy. It's the pop, it's the junk food. It's the muffins and cakes and bagels and breads. It's all of that. It just breaks down to sugar as soon as it hits your tongue. And if we aren't very careful about the amount of sugar that we are ingesting, what's happening is that, you know, adult, they call it adult onset diabetes. Now kids are getting it when they're teenagers. It's, it's backing down and down and down in age groups. We have a generation of kids who are more obese than any generation ever in history before. And it's not necessary. But we need, to, we need to understand the effect that sugar has on our body, and we need to teach our kids why it's not a good food choice. So again, you know, you can have these things sometimes, but not all the time. And the last thing that I talked with them about when it, it, with respect to nutrition is that not all foods are created the same. So you can imagine that there's more nutrition in, you know, a fist size portion of uh, chicken breast than there is in a donut about the same size. And so you want to pick the foods that have the most nutrient density as much as possible. So for example, yes, there's iron in bread because bread is fortified, but as a source of iron, you're so much better to have a piece of steak than you are to have like 18 pieces of bread to get the same amount of iron or whatever it is. I'm just throwing out numbers there, but you know what I mean? Choose the most nutrient dense foods first, which typically, again, that's the real foods. It's the meats, it's the veggies, fruits. Yes. Okay. So back to our plant. So we've talked about a good mind body connection. We've talked about nutrition. And I said, 
what do you think the next requirement is that your body has to be healthy? And one of the kids put up his hand right away and said, exercise. And I said, yes, you are absolutely right. And then we watched this awesome video. It is so funny. I've watched this video so many times with my kids. It's like these epic ex exercise fails. So it's people on treadmills that, you know, go off the end and people on chin-up bars where the chin-up bar falls. So like, not really funny, but it's really funny. So if you get a chance to watch that with your kids, they were killing themselves laughing. So I said, why is exercise important? And it's because every single human body needs to move. There isn't, I don't think there's a single health condition that can't be helped through increased exercise somehow. Our bodies were designed to move. And what I told the kids is that our bodies were not designed to be YouTube watching, Netflix binging, Fortnite obsessing, Snapchatting people. We were designed to be in motion. And the more your body is in motion in all different ways, the better off you're going to be. And so we talked about the different kinds of motion. So sports for sure, dance, activities, those kinds of things. Um, we talked about slow movement, fast movement, and we also talked about strength training. And the more you can, um, you know, just even play is really good movement for these kids. The more you can incorporate all these different kinds of things, the better it is. I did want to focus a little bit on strength training because it's not something that we're typically taught to do as kids, but this idea of, you know, I said to them, you don't necessarily have to be going out and buying a set of weights or trying to lift your parents' weights if they have them, but your ability to hold your body weight up, there is a reason why they have you do the, uh, you know, chin-ups and things like that in gym and push-ups and squats. You should be able to hold your body weight that's called functional training. It's strength training. It helps their bones develop. It helps their muscles develop. It's really good for health. And it's something, it's a habit that you should keep in your exercise routine through your entire life. So that idea of just being able to hold your own body weight. I said, how many of you have ever been on the monkey bars? And they all put their hand up. Yeah, like that's awesome functional training. So we talked about, you know, just running uh, biking, swimming, those kinds of really fast sprinting type motions are awesome. But we also talked about flexibility. And at this point, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but I am going to, I am going to spend a little bit of time with you because really it kind of applies to us as adults much more than it applies to kids. Kids are naturally very flexible. So we did some cool things in the class. I said, you know, how many of you can clasp your arms, you know, have them like this behind your back? And I showed them, you know, I can do it really well one way, but I can barely do it the other way. Um, I said, you know, ask your parents if they're able to bend down and touch the floor with their hands. That's a big sort of test of flexibility. And to be honest, they were so stuck on this picture of this woman doing this thing. They were like, wow. So I'm not sure how much they were listening. But one of the tests that I get patients to do in my office, it's called a sit to stand test. And you can try this at home you should be able to, so when you're standing up, cross one leg over the other, it doesn't matter which leg, cross one leg over the other, get yourself down so your bum is on the floor and get right back up again without using your hands at all. So not on your knees, not on the floor, you should be able to just sit and get back up with your hands kind of out here and not touching anything. That is, um, it's a test of how mobile you're going to be later on in life. So every point of contact that you have to make with your hands, I subtract a point from 10. Once you get below eight points, what, what the test tells us is that every point below eight, you're taking six years off the end of your life. And it kind of makes sense because if you can't do that as a 30 year old, what is your mobility going to be like when you're 70? And you know, the average age of entrance into a nursing home is only 71. And the number one reason that people go into a nursing home is lack of mobility. So using flexibility training as a regular part of your exercise routine in your week is really important. Things like yoga, um, you know, just doing even mobility work every single morning, getting all of your joints moving, um, you know, head exercises, neck, hips, leg swings, all of those different things, just getting your body moving goes a long way to creating health as you get older. Back to our plant. Okay, so we've done mind-body connection, we've done nutrition, we've done exercise. I said to them, first of all, I said, does anybody recognize this guy? Probably half the class did. So 
kind of comforting to know that some people still see the Simpsons, <laughs> good or bad, for good or for bad. But I, we talked about sleep and how important it is for your health. And I said, you know, you guys should be getting in the range of 10 plus hours of sleep a night. And so when I asked them to guess, like, how many hours of sleep should you get? Somebody said eight, somebody said 12. I said, awesome. So right in the middle of that, eight's probably not enough. 12 would be unusual for a kid your age, but awesome if you can get it. But 10 plus is what you need. And I said, do you think that your sleep environment, what's in your bedroom at sleep time, do you think it matters? And every single one of them said yes. And so it was really cool because we talked about devices. And I think this is a really really important point. So I really hit this point home with them that having devices in your bedroom at sleep time is a bad idea. And that what they really need to do is at least two hours before they go to sleep, they need to put their devices in a central area of the house. So on a charging station in a central part of their house and never, ever, ever have a laptop, a tablet, phone, anything like that in their bedroom because I mean, the reality is that if it's in the room, they're going to be more likely to be on it. And I explained to them that these devices have what's called blue light. And what blue light does is it actually tricks your brain into thinking that it's still daylight. I explained to them that, you know, the, the way the brain is designed is that as the sun goes down, as the light naturally begins to dim and the house just naturally begins to dim at night, it signals the brain to begin to create a sleep hormone called melatonin. And it starts to make you drowsy and it starts to get your whole body ready for sleep. And sleep is so important because that's the time where your body regenerates those cells, it heals, it repairs, and it rests and gets ready for the next day. But if you're watching a device, it's gonna make it much harder for you to fall asleep at night. So I said, get the devices away, stop being on them two hours before bedtime, and, you know, even TV does emit blue light, but because it's so much further away, it doesn't have the same effect. And because we interact with the TV very differently than we interact with handheld devices, it doesn't have quite the same effect. But even with that, I said, the best thing you can do is at least half an hour before bed, turn the TV off and read. It's a great way to just relax your brain, relax your mind and get you ready for sleep. And sleep is so important for your health. And I ask them, you know, what happens if somebody doesn't have enough sleep? What, like, what does it affect? And one of the kids said, it affects everything. And I said, yes, it totally affects everything. It affects their immune system. So people who don't sleep as well, they're sicker, they're moodier, they're more depressed. They find it harder to focus. They find it harder to finish their homework. They can't perform as well in sports. I mean, it literally affects every single aspect of your health. So getting enough sleep is really important. And the last health requirement that we talked about was um, having a positive mental attitude. So this isn't something that I find we talk a whole lot about with kids, but I, I, I wanted to just take this opportunity to tell them that, you know, being human, everybody has good things and bad things that happen to them, but it's their choice whether or not they focus on the good things or the bad things. That we're not naturally designed to be positive people. Some people are more positive than others, but that thinking hopefully, thinking happy thoughts, choosing to focus on the good things, it's a choice that we make and it's a skill that we need to develop just like learning to ride a bike or learning to ride a scooter or learning to play tennis or anything else. We have to practice this skill and I ask them, you know, do you hang out with friends who are uplifting and encouraging and make you feel good about yourself? Or do you hang out with people who kind of put you down, they're sarcastic and they don't make you feel good about yourself? What kind of a friend are you to other people? And that you have to make the choice to think happy thoughts if you want to have awesome health because how you think has a massive impact on the health of your body. And again, I said, you know, happy people, People who work at this are people who typically enjoy better health. They move more. They certainly have better immunity. They have better things happen to them. They just seem to attract it much more. So it's really worth their while to understand that how they think is a choice that they have a lot of control over. There's not a whole lot that they have control over as kids, but this is one thing that they have control over every single minute of every single day. And if they don't take control of that, 
they're going to go with sort of the default in our society, which is kind of negativity. And that was the end of the presentation. Um, you know, so we, again, we just recapped the requirements. So what do you need to be healthy? And they went around the room and they named them all. In our office, we say, eat right, move more, think better thoughts, get adjusted. Or eat right, move more, think well, sleep well, and make sure you have a good brain-body connection. So if you have any questions at all, you are welcome to call me, email me. Uh, you know, if you wanna check out my website, it's elevatewomenshealth.ca. I would love to see you in the office. We do complimentary consultations if you ever want to have just kind of a health checkup and see what's going on. I'd be happy to help you with that. But mostly, I hope you enjoy this information, have a chance to talk it over with your children, answer their questions, and maybe just begin some really awesome discussions about how you can create some great health habits in your family. Have a wonderful day. Stop and share. And like I said, if you have any questions at all, just let me know. Thank you.